We need to make them understand that the law is here not to fight against your culture, but to make your culture better. You pick the good and you let go of the bad. But staying in line because we are people and we are human beings and we must be governed by something. And that which governs us is a law. Not disregarding your culture, but following the law and adapting that which is good. This is the NFGM Podcast with Brenda Dora. Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. Today we talk about law and in this park in Nairobi I am seated with Brenda Dora, a human rights lawyer and policy advocacy expert working to transform the lives of vulnerable girls. More friendly policies and laws are crucial in fighting this vice. So, welcome to the fifth episode of the NFGM podcast, Dora your first contact with FGM cases in a law setting, mm. what was the situation? When we're talking about now my uh, direct interaction uh, with uh, FGM cases is now when I actively started working on uh, projects that were handling FGM directly um, um, and joining uh, an organization where I was act- you know, working as a project officer um, and also doubling up more of a policy advocacy advisor as well. And uh, the thematic area of this project was directly, you know, ending FGM and child marriage and then uh, focusing on the right to education for the girl child in pastoralist communities, giving me the platform to interact with different forms of FGM as well. Uh, and the different, you know, uh, dynamics to it, whether it was religion or just uh, a cultural practice. Uh, and also just trying to see uh, the linkages between, uh, you know, the law and uh, how these cases were either uh, reported or not reported and what were the challenges to it. Because then um, FGM was occurring uh, en masse, but uh, there was very little reporting of the cases. So just trying to, you know, create a little bit more sensitization, uh, let the community know that there's, uh, you know, a law that um, is existent uh, in Kenya uh, that can deal with cases of FGM and why communities need to report and not necessarily uh, fear uh, stigmatization or backlash for reporting such cases. So I think uh, with our communities, uh, you know, uh, there's always, you know, strength and power in knowledge. So you empower them and you make them aware. So you give them and the knowledge and then uh, they'd be able to uh, you'd be able to gauge how receptive they are by how many cases they report and whether they have the faith in the law uh, to ensure that um, the girls within their communities are protected um, and also uh, dealing with cases that are reported directly because we would have cases, uh, you know, uh, reported directly to us, you know, talking to the victim and the survivor and, you know, just feeling what it is uh, they feel at that moment. Because when they talk to you, you actually feel what it is they're saying. Because you then are as the closest person they can be able to open up to and the pain behind it. I think that is something that... Uh, may be so aware because you, you're not only, you know, sort of helping them carry the pain, but also understanding that in as much as then FGM has uh, has occurred, this is the remedy they have. And giving them the option that the chances, uh, you know, to accessing justice and how receptive they will they be to it. So there are different facets to FGM. Having interacted with it, you know, over the years, uh, since 2015, I think... Every day is a learning process. You always get to meet and uh, the legal challenges are different because every day you meet a different side of FGM. Yeah. You have been involved in in advocacy programs, not only f- in terms of policy formations, but also sat in, uh, in, in, in places where there are different people coming in 
from different sectors, from the from the NGO world, from um, communities that are affected by uh, FGM. As a lawyer, what would such meetings look like for you? So stakeholder, uh, for me, in response uh, to that question, I'd say that, uh, you know, stakeholder engagement is very good. And especially if we have a multi-sectoral approach, because each of us, uh, whether you are an activist, uh, an advocate, whether you're working in government, uh, both national and county, uh, whether uh, it's a faith-based organization um, or a community-based organization, we all bring our different and unique aspects to you know the campaign uh, towards ending FGM in Kenya. Uh, the meetings are usually uh, well represented and very uh, representative in the sense that uh, we get unique ideas, we try and see how we can be able to merge our efforts so such that we don't have uh, uh, duplication of efforts because if we work in isolation and in silos then we will lose, um, you know, um, what our target is towards the campaign and our target is ending FGM. That is the be all and end all of it. Um, we need to bring in different approaches and listen to each other. I think uh, most of the time and over the years, people have always been, you know, <laughs> working against each other, against of, uh, you know, against the backdrop of, um, you know, the ideal situation which should be working together and having a synchronized approach. So I think stakeholder engagement and also talking to each other and working with each other is a strong component of the campaign. And then we'll be able to seal those loopholes that we usually see or having uh, people working in one county and everyone is doing whatever it is they are doing in their own way instead of merging efforts. So for me, what I see is that over the years, the last three years, we have seen a lot more coordinated efforts. And I think this... Um, uh, particularly is because of, uh, you know, uh, what we're seeing the anti-FGM board doing because it's the, it's, it's, it's the um, uh, government, uh, you know, um, entity that has been mandated to ensure that a FGM ends in Kenya. So they've been able to coordinate as well. Uh, we have been able to have, you know, uh, both as... Um, uh, civil society actors or people who are working within the legal uh, um, fraternity, uh, people who are implementing on the ground, coming together and working with the board to ensure that all our efforts goes through one channel. These communities have lived with these cultures for years and years. The strategies that you've taken um, and looking at the background you've had in law, um, the strategies that you've taken and if not those that you would see would work in situations where we are trying to make the communities understand that FGM affects them negatively rather than um, having them look at it like we are attacking their culture. Are there things that you see would help in that? Uh, for me, what would help and um, in ensuring that in as much as we have the law, um, it is just not that you know, the law is a be all and end all of it. I mean, generally, yes, and the world over, the law is a law. You cannot circumvent the law. You must follow the law. However, uh, in law, we usually say um, ignorance of the law is no defense. Very interesting, particularly. But then, uh, for me, I would also bring in another dynamic. Ignorance of the law is no defense. What about this community that is not even aware of the law? You know, the community will say, uh, you went uh, to Nairobi, you decided to sit down and have this, and then you want to impose it on us. The law is already in place. What more do we need to do to ensure that um, they are at a place of knowledge? Uh, ensure that they actually know what the law says, what then their culture contravenes, because everyone comes from a background where your culture is what you have has been inculcated in you, and you just can't let go of it. So in as much as the law is very, very uh, important in governing, you know, people, uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that culture is entrenched, and we must see where we can get a linkage between the law and culture and try and merge, make them understand 
and then implement with their full ownership. I think for me, and being a lawyer, that is very important uh, to me to make sure that the community that um, I am doing, um, you know, awareness creation to is aware what what good parts of their culture they can be able to adopt, the bad that they need to let go, and why we need the law to ensure that they actually, uh, you know, let go. Because over time, FGM needs to end and they need to let go. But for them, they're still holding on to it because they feel like if they let go of their culture, they're betraying, you know, either their forefathers or who they are as a, as, as a people. So we need to make them understand that the law is here not to fight against your culture, but to make your culture better. You pick the good and you let go of the bad. But staying in line because we are people and we are human beings and we must be governed by something. And that which governs us is the law. Not disregarding your culture, but following the law and adapting that which is good. You've been working in different communities and um, your background in law um, brings you... Uh, to working with different people from law enforcers, from the community, from the survivors to organizations that are working, uh, trying to end this vice. Sometimes even talking to people who are funding these projects inside and outside the country. What's the importance of everyone knowing what the law says? Having the law in place does not mean we incarcerate everyone who uh, sort of, you know, uh, perpetuates uh, the vice, but also making them understand that uh, this, this vice needs to end. Uh, this is the approach you want to take, and this is why it needs to end. Because then if we are talking about the protection of the girl child, and, um, you know, focusing on things like education and having a multi-sectoral approach to it. Uh, we'd have donors come on board to ensure that we keep more of our girls in school. Uh, we have projects that have been designed in such a way that uh, there's a lot more social protection for the girl child and children generally, both the girl and the boy child. Um, and also, you know, ensuring that our efforts are to, towards one goal, which is protection of all children. And here we're looking at all children, but also vulnerable children. The girl is most vulnerable in this situation. If you, then we're talking about issues of FGM, issues of child marriage. And if the girl is very vulnerable, how, what measures do we put in place to ensure that she's well protected? Uh, we can have policy advocacy towards better laws for protection of children, and especially the girl child. Uh, we'd have uh, donors coming on board and, and projects being designed to ensure that we keep more of our girls in school. Then also um, understanding that, um, you know, education is a key component and education is the greatest equalizer the world over. So as a country, you must stand up and say, you know what, we value our girl child. We know what the girl child has been going through. Um, and even within family setup, you'd find that there are scenarios or situations where uh, the girl will bear, uh, you know, the more the brunt of if poverty then uh, struck a particular family. It's the girl who will bear the brunt. She'll be married off for the parents to get a diary. So she'll, she'll be married off even early, they get the dowry. So it's like she's an income earner. That's what I usually say. The girl is an income earner for, uh, for her family in whatever context it is. So if we're, we're able to better protect her and say, okay, fine. So what is our entry point for the protection of the girl child? Education is the first. Empower this girl, ensure she goes to school, ensure she finishes school, um, you know, get a good job be able to, you know, support her family instead of just marrying her off and continuing the cycle of poverty. So I think um, stakeholder engagement and also stakeholders working together is something that is good and very valuable in this campaign because then, one, we'll be pulling resources together, uh, we'll be speaking in one voice, and we'll be able to implement uh, projects or uh, sort of programs that are very uh, cognizant of uh, the protection of children generally. And also, with regards to vulnerable children, we're looking at the girl child first. Uh, you work with policemen who are basically uh, law enforcers mm -hmm. who are um, on the ground dealing with the community and 
uh, always being the ones who faced, uh, who faced the wrath of the community. Mm. And uh, you've had, of course, sessions where you are able to discuss some of these issues. Mm. Are there concerns in, term, in terms of uh, trying to implement uh, mm. these, these policies? Mm. Yes, I've worked with the police. I have also um, uh, trained uh, quite a number of them. Um, currently, I'm running a project where I am uh, uh, training police officers um, in uh, the police uh, colleges. And um, the concerns that have been raised, one is that uh, most of them feel that it's hard for them to enforce the law, especially within the communities they come from, which is an interesting dynamic. Um, I, had, I have interacted with someone who tell me, but madam, you know what? I'm from this community and this is my culture. I don't think I can go against my culture. But for me, the first question that goes to them is that, are you not a law enforcement officer? This is your duty. You must do it. So in as much as it is hard for you to enforce the law, you must enforce because that is what you're called, called to do. By virtue of being a law enforcement officer, that is what you're required to do. And I've always been able to, you know, sit and reason with them and tell them, okay, well, you do come from these communities, but here we have uh, legislation that demands that you enforce the law. So you must enforce the law because then the government entrusts you to ensure that, you know, the law is enforced. Uh, the other challenge is that uh, most of them uh, feel that, oh, if they're working within these communities um, and, uh, you know, they try and enforce the law against uh, FGM or child marriage, that, you know, uh, They'll be met with violence, they'll be met with uh, people who are disagreeing that they're trying to curtail their culture. Uh, but what we have done so far, uh, uh, me and some of my colleagues who usually train the police, is that we, give the, we break it down to them. Uh, what exactly the law says when you when you conduct an arrest what do you need to uh, look at in terms of evidence you know leading to issues of fgm you know how you need to uh, treat uh, the you know survivors uh, how you handle them especially if they're children because most of them and the cases that are reported and uh, the some the samples that we had that they gave us is that uh, some of them are children so we tell them this is how you handle a child this is how you talk to them this is what you look at in terms of evidence to ensure that uh, once you have done the investigation and the matter is then uh, the file is handed over to the ODPP the cases do not uh, either lapse in court or you know are dismissed for lack of evidence so we take them through the law break it down so that it's very simple they are aware if it's a case of FGM this is what we need to look at this is how we partner with uh, you know um, other you know uh, law Local administrative officers on the ground, especially the chiefs and assistant chiefs. This is what we're looking at to ensure that uh, such a charge will hold in court. You know, these are the things that we're able to uh, take them through. We not only sensitize them, but we also give them a finer reading of the law for them to be able to understand. Because remember, the police are very crucial. And for me, usually I say law enforcement officers, the police, and local administration, the chiefs and area uh, sub-chiefs, are very important in the campaign because these are the people who who these cases are reported to first. They're the gateway into the criminal justice system. So without them fully understanding what the law says, how they need to enforce the law, then we will have failed because then they are the entry point to this chain that needs to, you know, um, be very well linked, very strong. We, you know, seal the loopholes, ensure that we do get convictions and, you know, how watertight is this case. So if they're not able to do proper investigations without understanding the law, then clearly we will not get, you know, or this victim or survivor will not get the justice that they deserve for this thing that has been done to them. And access to justice is very, very important if you're talking about issues of, uh, you know, FGM, child marriage, and what the, you know, um, the campaign entails. Because after all is said and done, for this victim or survivor who has been aggrieved, how then 
do they get justice? And that has always been my question. And for me, that's a question I pose to them. Would you like to see that this girl has suffered now and will continue to suffer? At least what is the remedy that you will be giving or that you know the criminal justice uh, system will be giving to that victim or survivor? Are there mechanisms where there are people who would like to volunteer as a lawyer or, uh, or even you mm -hmm. um, if, if there are avenues where people could explore and, and try to seek justice for these children when they are not able to stand up for themselves? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if someone mo much more quote-unquote powerful is trying to support people who performed mm -hmm. uh, FGM on children. It is so unfortunate that we do not have political goodwill in the campaign to end FGM. Politicians need to be at the forefront and say, we do not support this. We want our girls to stay in school. Because then politicians influence the community. Because these are people who have elected you, but you need to stand for a cause. I feel like if even one of them or two of them would stand strongly on the cause of, you know, um, the campaign against FGM and rally others to come on board, we'll at least get some somewhere. But of course, you're not a politician, so really? they, <laughs> it doesn't work or, uh, that way all the time. Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we are relying on policies drafted and, um, and, and enacted in both the national and, and, and county governments, mm -hmm. and you've been involved in some of them. Mm -hmm. um, what would these policies look like? And uh, if you would be able to give an example of uh, one that you helped draft uh, or push for passing, what's the process and how does it look like? Are there any challenges on the way? So um, with regards to that, uh, the first one that I would uh, cite or bring to the limelight is um, uh, the Kajiado County uh, policy on the eradication of FGM. Um, I've interacted with the process midway, uh, but it had already uh, started. Uh, so for me, uh, I was bringing in my expertise as a policy advocacy um, advisor, sort of, and also, um, you know, trying to give technical expertise to the, uh, you know, uh, the tail end of the formulation of the policy together with other partners and other organizations. Um, so they have they have a really good policy on ending uh, eradicating FGM, uh, of which uh, should it be passed, then Kajado County would then be at the forefront in you know showing other partialist counties that um, also are hotspot counties in in you know in the practice of FGM that you know what as counties we can do this, we can ensure the protection of our of our children especially the girl child and ensure that you know they. Stay in school and uh, we eradicate the vice. So the process was really good. It, it was an eye-opener because there are different factors coming on board and especially the issue of um, you know public participation and ownership of the process which was really good and was well done and right now the policy is at the final stages. We also have other counties like Masabet who are now in uh, the initial stages of formulating a policy which is more of uh, um, all-inclusive and sort of oriented towards an all-inclusive child protection policy that encompasses all issues affecting children and FGM and child marriage being one of one of them, and how they actually want as a county to deal with these issues, which I find is good because then um, counties are, are now getting more capacity to ensure that they are focusing uh, on children's issues as a priority area, uh, which is good because then if they are focusing uh, on children, then they need to think about you know issues of child rights budgeting, you know, and uh, trying to see how how issues of children are dealt with and breaking it down to a point where they say these are our priority areas affecting our children in our country and this is the amount of money we want to put to it. What if it's FGM and child marriage? Are they receptive to it? Most of them are then politicians who would want to shy away from it. But then we tell them it's, it gets to a point you need to boldly take up this mantle and say, okay, well, these are the issues affecting our children. This is how we want to deal with them. Um, so I think from a policy advocacy angle, 
there has been a bit more receptiveness. I think the next challenge has been, and even what we are seeing is that, yes, we see a bit of these issues uh, being and uh, had been already captured within the second generation of uh, CIDPs, the county integrated development plans. But also now we need to go a step further and see how much money or funding are you allocating from the county budget to handle uh, these issues affecting children. And being specific, and telling them our priority area is FGM child marriage. How much are you willing to allocate to that? Are you working together with the anti-FGM board? How can you pull resources together? Because then remember, the anti-FGM board is there, but they also need more funding. But also with the counties having funding and, and their own budgets, can they be able to set aside uh, funding to ensure that the also coalescing their efforts together with the with the national government through the anti-FGM board and prioritizing those areas. So for me, those were the kind of questions I was posing out to counties and trying to see, do they have the goodwill to pick it up? So then with Kajiado County having started and others struggling, we're trying to see, will they be a beacon of hope to the rest of the hotspot counties, would they be able to pick it up? Or having others who are as receptive as, you know, West Pokot County and kudos to their governor who is like, you know what, we are, we are receptive to this. Counties like Samburu, where we have activists, you know, already uh, speaking to the county government and telling them this is a key priority area. Let us delve into it. Let us have funding for it. Let us work together. So I think counties, um, for posterity and, and, and moving forward and, you know, to have a progressive campaign against FGM and child marriage are a key determinant as to how uh, this campaign will, you know, uh, take a curve, either uh, an upsurge or a dive in the next two, three years as to how they prioritise these areas. While coming up with these uh, policies, um, are there challenges from... For, from from either the people or even the politicians who are supposed to uh, help pass it? Policy formulation is a tedious process because there's always a lot of lobbying, a lot of back and forth. Do we need it? Do we not need it? Is it, is it a must? Is it a priority? So there are a lot of questions to ask. With regards to challenges is that... Um, a bit of, you know, uh, communities feeling like, mm, oh, well, uh, it's like they want to curtail our culture, sort of, uh, that also coming up. But once they're able to understand, because you have to do uh, the initial agenda setting, why we need this policy, create awareness, do a lot of research around it. Um, and I think at the moment, uh, Research and data is a key determinant as to how uh, policy um, formulation and the trends that uh, formula, uh, policy formulation will, will take. Because if you don't have representative data, then clearly someone will ask you, how sure are you that this is a key priority area? Uh, so you must uh, back your uh, you know, proposal for whatever policy you want to bring on board with research and data. And statistics, you know, that is strong and can hold uh, the test of time, I believe so. But that having been said, um, the challenges have been that um, in the initial agenda setting, you feel there's people are a bit aloof. They don't want to open up. They don't feel that it's important. And even for members of county assembly, they feel like there are better issues we need to deal with um, instead of, you know, dealing with, uh, issues of FGM and child marriage, which to them they feel like, oh, you know, those are uh, women's issues, gender issues, really. We have serious things to deal with. So um, you need to ease them in, showing, showing them how important and why we need this policy in the first place. Uh, the other thing is that uh, sometimes um, they don't pass because then you don't have enough quorum or uh, you haven't uh, sort of sensitized them enough. Or if you have sensitized them enough, uh, they still don't feel that uh, that is a policy that should be enacted now, maybe with the next county assembly, maybe they take it up. So with a lot of lobbying here and there, back and forth, you know, concessions here and there, okay, let's do this, maybe it will be to a bigger place plan, you see they're a bit more receptive in trying to get a point person. I think with policy, if you get a strong point person that is able to push your agenda, then it, the battle is half won 
per se, because then they'll take your agenda, run with it, you know, have a lot of caucusing with them, you know, have a lot of workshops with them, training with them. And I think the example that we would have is like the county government of, of uh, Kajado. The previous county assembly, before then this policy was formulated, there was a lot of, you know, lobbying, taking them for workshops, training them, making them understand what FGM is, what are some of the, you know, psychosocial implications, health, you know, implications of FGM. It was so much for them to actually say, you know what, we had no idea that this is what women and girls go through. We are ready bring that document. Let's look at it. Let's have this conversation. So you must always start talking. Talk, talking, you know, builds that avenue. Talking, a lot of awareness creation, a lot of sensitization opens that avenue for you to have a, vi a viable policy that will stand, that will be passed, that will be implemented. Because then with policy, once it has been passed, or any legislation, once it has been passed, the next step and the next hurdle is implementation. And implementation needs resources. And who does their location, still you'll have to go back to them. You have to speak to the county executives, you have to speak to the members of county assembly, and you have to speak with the you know, county departments handling these issues, so that once this policy is passed, you have resources for implementation. And they will also bring in goodwill to implement it, because then you can have it as a piece of paper, but then it will be dead. Why? Because then it will not be implemented. You wanted it? Here it is. We have passed it. That's it. We've done our part. But what about implementation? That's the next hurdle. Implementation is a very key part of this, uh, because we've had the prohibition of the, um, of, of the practice of FGM Act, um, passed by parliament uh, more than eight years ago now, about eight years ago now. But we still have problems where people say, um, you know, it's, it's, not it's not applicable to our community or we've not been sensitized. We don't know what this is. We've been practicing this since uh, time immemorial. So um, I agree with you that, that um, implementation is key, mm. but there is need for um, awareness uh, for the community so that they, they don't feel like, okay, these people are coming in to arrest us, but we've been, my, my father did this, my mother did this, I, was, I went through this, mm. and I don't see the problem of not allowing my child to go through mm. this because it's part of our identity. Mm. Any challenges you've had um, trying to solve an issue that involved a child or even a woman um, undergoing FGM in a certain community. In communities where they decide to use the informal channels, um, they call them informal sort of uh, channels of access to justice. <laughs> Uh, so what happens is that, you know, they negotiate within a clan or community, paying some money and then, you know, saying... Or cows. Clearly, cows or camels, whichever, or goats, and say that we have handled the matter and the case is withdrawn, uh, which for me has been, you know, one of those uh, low moments in the campaign because then here we have a child, this has happened, then you withdraw the case... Those are hard times, you know, and for you to have followed up with the case. We have uh, instances where, you know, witnesses are, you know, intimidated. Uh, we have, uh, witness, you know, uh, scenarios or incidences where you find that, uh, you know, bribes are paid uh, to law enforcement to kill the cases. Uh, but I've handled one case where the mother... Um, I was very adamant because I think for her she felt aggrieved that her daughter had been cut in her absence and without her knowledge and she was not for that. So uh, the grandmother and the aunties, uh, you know, uh, were very, you know, were very sly. So they waited until she traveled and then they cut the girl and she was, she was very bitter about it uh, because she felt that her child and her daughter uh, needed to, you know, make her own choices you know, um, and having having her stand 
on her daughter's behalf for something that, you know, was a proud moment for me because she understood the implications of what FGM would have on her child um, and why she was really pursuing the case. She was like, you know what, I didn't like it. This practice is being done on children who are minors who don't really understand the implication of what FGM is, but they've been forced into it, coerced into it. So I think those are some of the high moments and the low moments. And then you're having, uh, you know, uh, communities who don't still fully understand that the law is there and the law must be followed. They totally disregard the law and blatantly so uh, communities, I don't want to particularly point out which, but we know them, communities that will, that will actually even say to activists that we're going to do it and you've got no power to say no. And having um, politicians and political leaders from these communities keep mum about it. Um, you know, communities that will go ahead and perpetuate the vice and dance on the road for everyone to see. And telling, you know, um, anti-FGM activists and advocates that there's nothing you can do about it. I believe uh, the law can do something about it. Something else is implementation. And as I said before, implementation requires resources. So I think it's about time also government uh, becomes cognizant of the fact that this is something that is ongoing. We have the law. But for us to fully implement the law, um, you know, state agencies that are mandated with uh, ensuring full implementation of the pro prohibition of uh, Female Genital Mutilation Act, be it the police, be it uh, the ODPP, be it the anti-FGM board, need to, you know, be given proper resources to ensure that implementation is undertaken and undertaken successfully and with good resources. And then also in terms of, you know, speaking about it without stigmatizing, because another challenge is communities and people within communities feel that if they talk against FGM, they'll be stigmatized. It's about time we let go of it and talk freely about it. If we have been able to get to a level where if we're talking about, for example, uh, HIV and AIDS and, you know, the rate of stigma and stigma going down and people living positively, then I believe even with FGM, which then um, is equally as life-threatening as HIV is, then we need to actually um, ensure that we let go of stigma and say that we are now openly, as a society and as a country, talking about issues of female genital mutilation and child marriage by extension because one is a precursor to the other. Um, another challenge would be, uh, you know, having um, an environment where we have, um, you know, our law enforcement officers, both from local administration and the police, not clearly understanding what the law or where the law stands on issues of FGM. I think a little bit more capacity and, uh, you know, um, civil society uh, activists or advocates who are implementing directly on FGM need to take up this much better, ensure that they are more aware because they might, you know, have so many other cases to deal with. And here we are telling them they also need to investigate and, you know, uh, handle cases of FGM and child marriage. But they do not have that capacity. I think we also need to uh, ensure that we support the government. Because remember, in this campaign, we are not fighting against the government as we fight in the campaign against FGM. But we are trying to see how best can we have a multi-sectoral approach. How, where and how can we support government? For me, I think and I believe that in our work and in this campaign, we must always work with government. They have set... Um, you know, uh, we have what the law says, we have what government has put in place. How can we support them to deliver that which they envision? And for me, government, if it's going to stand strongly against FGM and declare publicly that this is the campaign, then we need to support them in ending FGM in Kenya. Well, uh, so let's bring this to a close. Um there are people who are working in different parts of the country, in different sectors of the country. As you said, you need a multi-sectoral approach. Mm -hmm. What would you say to anyone who's working in this field? Let's assume you are speaking to, uh, uh, while speaking to 
um, people running campaigns with organizations, NGOs, CBOs, or even individuals, what would you tell them um, in, re in regards to better involving uh, lawmakers um, and policymakers um, in the ending of FGM? Anyone who is joining the campaign needs to be very critical uh, because these are very uh, dicey issues we're dealing with. First of all, you're dealing with culture. Second of all, you're dealing with children. So you must always weigh and see, are your intentions clear? And what are your intentions towards the campaign? Uh, you must have a vision. I think for me joining the campaign, my clear and critical vision even as I work, uh, as an individual and as an activist towards ending FGM, I was very clear that the girl must be allowed to reach her fullest potential. So with that in mind and that being the goal, we must protect each and every child and each and every girl to reach her fullest potential. So um, for us and for me uh, being in the campaign, it's very important for us to be able to factor in uh, what data do we have that is representative of the work we're doing on the ground and also how do we rope in that person who is doing or is in the campaign in the individual capacity, that person who is in the campaign um, as a group, you know, whether a CBO, an NGO, you know, a faith-based organization, organization or whatever, or, you know, people who are within uh, government, who are implementers um, at the national government, how do we rope in our efforts together without looking down upon someone and saying, oh, well, so what are you bringing on the campaign? We must put our hands together. That single activist or those groups of activists against FGM must stand as one and we must always speak in one voice. For me, I think if everyone will be speaking in their own voice, it will be detrimental to the campaign. We must speak in, in one voice and also listen to the community because the community knows where and how this vice can end. So we don't need to sit in those boardrooms and say, okay, well, as technical advisors, we feel that one, two, three, four will work. Have we involved the community to let us know? Because then they'll wait for us to take the interventions on the ground, laugh at us, and the vice will continue. But if we involve them, we tell them, okay, well, this is culture, you value it, it's your culture, but give us a way out, something else that is different, so that we end this. We don't cut our girls, but we're able to, you know, um, make them get to what... Um, make them get to the potential that they have through this. Give us those ideas. Then let us work with the community's ideas and what they envision for their children and their girls within that particular point in time. Amazing. So um, we bring this to a close. If someone wants to reach you, if you are available to get reached to... I'm reachable via email. I usually prefer email on uh, bdora63 at gmail.com. So bdora, the Dora is D-O-R-A, 63 at gmail.com. Amazing. Thank you very much. I've really learned a lot, uh, Brenda. Uh, thank you also for uh, your time here at this very windy park. <laughs> um, you are listening to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. And today we are with Brenda Dora, who is a policymaker. And her background is low and has been working with uh, children, policymakers from both the national and uh, county governments. And also uh, the implementation partners that come on board to try help these girls get justice uh, from the ground. Thank you very much and see you next time. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com K-I-P-A-I-N-O-I.com Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference. For we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.